Hey, how's it going, Harbour City? Hi, everybody. Carl and Ro here. Um, just thought we'd report back that um, we're still living and kicking in, in this marriage, in this union. <laughs> um, Survived the first two months yeah, which in is, lockdown. <laughs> which, has been, which has been really cool. Um, yeah, we uh, we miss everyone. We love everyone. We can't wait to like all see and meet in person again sometime in the future. Um, how's how's marriage been, Ro? It's been great. <laughs> <laughs> it's been really lovely, and we've also been very blown away by how generous the church has been in this time um, and how encouraging you guys have been. So thank you so much. We really, really miss you, especially um, starting a new phase of our lives, and we would love to be. Oh, sorry, <laughs> sorry. Uh, we would love to be seeing you and chatting through things, but um, we know that that time will come soon, and we so look forward to it. Um, yeah. Um, so yeah, I think like one encouragement from us is, I think you know. The, this this time has been so different for so many different people um, so this really is contextual but I think for us it really has been like a slow down and um, reevaluate a couple of things and one thing that we've really enjoyed together is is planting um, so we've been like growing lots of different things in our house um, but this is a uh, lettuce <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that we bought um, from the, the Warwick um, market uh, today actually and then we've been growing some other things and one thing that I've kind of felt the Lord say repeatedly to me during this time is that um, well, I think that he's put like specific seeds in people's hearts over a period of time and, and now the stuff is is almost coming to a harvest like there's seedlings there's new things growing that like you know, the, the famine or the fire, whatever you want to call it, has kind of uh, cleared things out. And now there's a time for, for something new. Um, and then that might sound a little bit cheesy, but I think it's real. And the other thing is, I think um, God is calling some people to, like in Jeremiah 32, um, to go out and, and buy the field. It's like there's a, there's a, this is a risky time and it's an unknown time. But I think God is calling specific people to make specific moves that require you to trust him and take a first step to like stand and start something. Um, and and I think the, the context of Jeremiah buying that field is that they're under siege from the Babylonian empire and like money and resources are so scarce. He takes everything that he owns and he goes and buys this field, which seems like pretty ridiculous, pretty lavish while under siege. And, um, and then God says, actually, no, this is what I'm going to be using um, to almost like restart the produce and providence of, of Israel afterwards. Um, so yeah, that's just an encouragement from us. And anything else from you? We love and miss you all. Cheers, guys. Bye. Enjoy the sermon. Bye. Good morning, Harvest City. I'm Yeranzai. I want to introduce to you my lockdown baby. She was born on the 28th of March and her names are Makanaka Hope. Makanaka is Shona for you a good God and hope for we can never lose hope even in this trying and confusing times. Bye! The City family, we're missing you all lots. Hope everyone's been staying safe during the lockdown. Uh, for us it's been a very special time during the lockdown. We've got a new addition to our family. His name is Leo. Leo is seven weeks old today, and we're very proud to introduce them into the Harvest City family. Hope you all keep well. Bye. City family, I know that quite a few of us have been trying to grow stuff during this lockdown period, and um, Jesus often talked about plants when he spoke about spiritual growth. And I've realized a few really important things about that. Um, one of them is a position to the sun, um, the other one is the soil and roots and if those can be good and um, going down really nice and far and then also about daily watering so I've applied it to my spiritual life with being positioned firmly in God's Son Jesus uh, making sure that I've got good foundational roots in the Word and I found those devotionals daily um, really help with that 
and of course being filled daily with the Holy Spirit. And I'm just so excited to see the spiritual growth around me, of the people in our home groups and in the church. And it doesn't matter what the season, God can use everything for His glory. Love you all. Hope to see you soon. Bye. Good morning, everybody, and thank you so much for joining us. Uh, you're so welcome here, Harbor City people. If you're visiting, you're also welcome here, and uh, welcome to our home. We're going to worship our Father, and I want to encourage you to join in, stand up if you can, and uh, let's just have fun. I think it's a, it's a wonderful set list we've got today, uh, full of joy and singing about joy, and uh, let's just pray and consecrate the time before we actually start. Our Father in heaven, thank you so much for this beautiful day, Lord. And we want to consecrate this time. And even if we're watching it from our lounges or our cell phones or whatever the means are, um, Father, help us to just connect with you, Lord. Help mm -hmm. us to think of what you've done for us on the cross. Help us to give you praise back, Lord. Help us to give your name thanks. And help our hearts to turn to thanksgiving for what you've done, Lord. Thank you that you inspire joy and we can rejoice in you, Father. And may that happen this morning. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Come and stand before your Maker, full of wonder, full of fear. Come behold His power and glory, yet with confidence drawn near. For the one who holds the heavens and commands the stars above is the God who bends to bless us with an unrelenting love. Rejoice! Come and lift your hands and raise your voice. He is worthy of our praise. Rejoice! Seeds of your King and with trembling rejoice. We are children of the promise, the beloved of the Lord, one with everlasting kindness, bought with sacrificial blood, bringing reconciliation to a world that longs to know. The affections of a father who will never let them go rejoice. Come and lift your hands and raise your voice. He is worthy of our praise. Rejoice. Sing of mercies of your King. sickness, all our sorrows, Jesus carried up the hill. He has walked this path before us, He is walking with us still. Turning tragedy to triumph, turning agony to praise. There is blessing in the battle, so take heart and stand amazed. To him he hears your voice, he will wipe away your tears, rejoice, in the midst of suffering, he will help you sing, rejoice, come and lift your hands and raise your voice, he is worthy of our
yourself in life And darkness tries to hide And trembles at his voice And trembles at his voice How great is our God Sing with me how great The Godhead tree in one Father, Spirit, Son The Lion and the Lamb Lion and the Lamb How great is our God Sing with me how great is our God Sing with me how great is our God Oh, we'll see how great and how great is our God What have you done? Murdered for me on that cross Accused in absence of wrong My sin washed away in your blood Too much to make sense of it all Know that your love breaks my fall the Scandal of grace You died in my place on oh, my soul will live Oh, to be like you Give all I have just to know you Jesus, there's no one beside Your sting. Your power is as dead as my sin. The cross has taught me to live. Mercy, my heart now to sing. Day and it 
this trouble shall come Know that your strength is enough The scandal of grace You died in my place So oh, my soul to know you better, Father. We long to know you better. Thank you that we know you love us, Lord, and we love you. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so, so much for joining us, guys. It was wonderful. Hope you have a wonderful Sunday. Enjoy the sermon that's going to follow, and see you guys soon. Love you. Bye. Good morning, Harvest City Church. If you don't know me, my name is Brendan, and I'm just going to be sharing a couple of community updates with us this morning. At Harbour City, we believe that a church is built not on the gifts and talents of a few, but rather on the sacrifice of many. And we have a couple who's been with our church since day one. They've been leading a serving team since day one. They've hosted Alpha groups, starting points, and life groups in their homes. They are a couple who loves to have people in their home. And they are the definition of the Afrikaans word to care. And Christo and Marika Klein are leaving us. They actually have left. They've joined, uh, they've gone up to Gauteng two weeks ago. And normally what we would love to do is just to celebrate them, we'd love to pray for them, we'd love to prophesy over, over them, we'd love to bring them up to the front and just show them how much we love them as a community. But we couldn't do that because of our circumstances. So this morning at quarter past 11, you can check out our Zoom details here at the bottom of the screen. We're going to be joining together, meeting with them, we're going to be able to encourage them, prophesy over them, pray for them and just show them how much we love them. So everybody is invited, please join us at quarter past 11 to send a big shout out and encouragement to Krista and Marika Klein, a couple who we absolutely love and are going to miss dearly. Our second community update is that we've got a kids church, a Harbour City kids church meeting next week. We're going to be meeting over Zoom at half past nine. What we would love, if you're a parent of a kiddie in our community, we'd love you to prioritize this time. All we want to do is get our kids to sit down together, to meet together, to see one another. It's been a long time since they've been able to connect and we love and miss our kids. 
So all we're going to be doing is playing a game. We're going to be praying together, maybe reading a Bible story and just having some fun. So please prioritize it with us. Join us next week at 9.30 for our Harvest City Kids Zoom call. Thirdly, we've got a whole bunch of visitors coming to join us next week. First of all, we've got Tulo and Bambo, who's going to be leading a band from Red Point Pine Town. They're going to be leading us in worship in the morning, just using their gifts to lead us as a community and bless us and helping us worship Jesus together. And secondly, we've got a guy called Robertson Tuli, who's going to come in and preach to us, continuing our In Durban As It Is In Heaven series. And Grant had an interview with him this week, speaking about Jesus, race and racism. If you haven't checked that out yet, please look at our YouTube channel. It was an incredibly helpful evening and interview. So please check it out. And lastly, our life groups have been taking a mid-year break, but they're reconvening on the 7th and the 11th of July. So please diarize those dates. It's a great place to get connected into the community of Harbour City, Durban. So please prioritize those. If you're not in a life group yet, check out some of our leaders on our website. It would be great to connect with one of their Zoom meetings again. Those are going to be kicking off again on the 7th and the 11th of July. Have an incredible day, Harbour City. Much love to all of you. Good morning, everyone. It's Grant here, and we're into week two of our In Durban As It Is In Heaven series. Now, last week in our intro, we spent time in John chapter three and looked at Jesus's invitation to us, saying, you must be born again. And I really asked us two questions in that message. The first is, have you been born again? Or have you been renewed personally by the Spirit of God? And secondly, if you have been, if you are born again of the Spirit, then is the kingdom of God coming in your heart and life? And is the will of God being done in you more and more? Is His kingdom advancing inside of you and through you? Now, if you didn't miss it, I'd really encourage you to go back and listen to that message for the first time, just because it is a foundation for the series and a really, really important component. But over the next two weeks, what we're going to do is we're going to spend time at like a 30,000 foot view looking at this idea of gospel renewal. And then after that, we're going to spend a few weeks at like a street level looking at a couple of topics of what it looks like to live this out in our everyday lives. So let me start today with a very simple definition of renewal, because I think for most of us, when we hear that word, we associate it with something negative. We hear renewal and we don't think about in Durban as it is in heaven and the kingdom of God advancing. We think about our old ID book or passport or driver's license. And I need to go to home affairs and get it renewed. And we think of a chore when we hear renewal. We think of admin and standing in a long line and taking time off work and a lot of effort and hard work to get this thing done. And because of that, I'll just share with you my guilty confession that last year, my driver's license was about six months overdue. I really needed to go get it renewed. And I just had this mindset block, just thinking, I can't do this. I I can't go and get this done. I couldn't bring myself to all the effort of going and getting my drivers renewed. But the renewal we're speaking about in this series is so different and it's so exciting. So very simply, Gospel renewal is what God is at work doing in our world. Gospel renewal is what God is at work doing in our world. In Matthew 19 verse 28, Jesus is speaking with his disciples about the future and about eternal life and about his kingdom coming and about a time where he rules and reigns over all things from his throne. And he uses this amazing term. He says to them, truly, I tell you at the renewal of all things or in the ESV, in the new world or in the NLT, when the world is made new at the renewal of all things. Jesus is speaking about a moment in the future that is coming, a moment that we should be looking forward to, where everything will be renewed and made the way that it is supposed to be. Now, we've spoken about this a couple of times over the last few years. Renewal is one of our six cultures or values as a church. This is something we're going after together. And in Revelation 21, verse 1 to 5, we have this picture or vision of what that moment, that that day of the renewal of all things will look like. And it starts in verse 1, saying, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne, saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. And he who is seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all 
things new. That's the vision. That is the vision. That is the tra trajectory of the world and all of human history, which is really encouraging at a time like this when the world seems so crazy and it seems like everything is falling apart. That is where we are headed. That's what we're looking forward to. And that is what God invites us to play a role in the renewal of all things. Now, notice this, that in that future picture of eternal life, mankind is not floating around in the clouds with wings and halos and harps. And we're not these disembodied spiritual beings at all, like we would have seen in cartoons or in shows growing up. Now, eternal life, the, the picture we see of the future world where mankind is with God is one where we are on this earth, but it's a renewed earth. And we live in a place where heaven and earth have overlapped and are together. Revelation 21 verse 1, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Now when I hear new there, I think brand new, out of the box, exciting. You know, so I read this and I think out with the old earth, in with the new earth, with all the bells and whistles of this exciting new thing. Now I've never bought a new car, but um, I, I've bought secondhand cars before. But I can imagine the excitement of getting rid of an old junky piece of car and getting a new car with that new car smell, all the bells and whistles, like with that bow on it and everything. I think that would be an amazing moment. And here we see this picture of the new heavens and the new earth. And it's so easy for us to picture that, the new earth smell, that, that bow on this new earth. And it feels exciting, especially as we're living through a time like this, where our world is so wild. It can feel tempting to throw this earth away and start again from scratch. But the word new here doesn't mean brand new. It's the Greek word kanos, which means more to renew. So don't think of a brand new earth or a brand new car. Think rather of an old car, like a vintage car that's really run down and needs a lot of TLC. And it's a car that a, a car lover has taken, a, a mechanic, and they've worked on it and they've restored it and spent Saturday after Saturday just getting it up to scratch. And now this car is perfectly renewed. It's the kind of car you would drive, I don't know, the, down the streets on the weekend or take to a car show and rev the engine and honk the horn and everyone would gather around because they wanted to see it. Think of that. Think of an old car that has been restored and now is as good as new. That's what's going on in Revelation 21. And that picture of cosmic renewal, the renewal of all things, is exactly what Jesus is doing inside of each one of us. That's what we spoke about last week. In 2 Corinthians 5.17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, and that is key, you must be in Christ, you must be born again. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. And that word new again is the Greek word kainos, which means that when we become Christians, God doesn't take our old, sinful, broken self and throw us in the sin bin. Instead, what he does is he takes us as we are and he makes us new. He renews us. We are given this new life inside of Jesus and we are restored and made new and become a new creation in his image. And our personal spiritual renewal is symbolic of that cosmic renewal or the renewal of all things that God is at work doing even now and which will be fully and finally realized when Jesus returns. You see, we are, as hard as it is to believe this sometimes, we, even as ordinary people, we are the people of the future living here in the present, in Durban in 2020, in lockdown, with everything going around us. We are the people of the future living in the present. And this new creation life, this renewed life, this salvation life, which is at work inside of us, God has always intended that it would flow from us, not just to people, but from us to every part of the world and influence all things. We're talking socially, culturally, economically, spiritually, politically, ecologically, holistically. That is the vision. And we see this in Colossians chapter 1. Colossians 1 is maybe the most Christological, Christocentric passages in all of the Bible. We see Jesus as the creator of all things, the one who holds all things together. We see that he is the savior of the world. It's through his death that we are saved. See all of the beauty of Christ. But in verse 20, it says, through him, through Jesus, God is at work to reconcile everything, not some things, everything to himself whether things on earth or things in heaven by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. So just as Jesus has renewed and restored us, he is at work and will restore everything. And there will be a renewed heaven and earth, free from sin 
and suffering. And at the moment, this is good news. Free from sickness, free from death, free from suffering and sadness, free from pain, free from evil. And again, as is so relevant at the moment, free from injustice and evil and brokenness and inequality, all the things that we see around us in our world and even in our own hearts at this time. All of those things will be made new and will be the way they're supposed to be. And God will be with us and we will be with him and we will be his people and he will be our God. That's the picture that is to come. But we are currently somewhere in the middle of the story, somewhere between creation and new creation, somewhere between the beginning and the renewal of all things. So while we wait for that day where Jesus returns and takes us home and things are the way they should be, you know, what is our part to play in the story? What do we do in the meantime? If you've got your Bible with you, you can turn to Genesis 1 verse 26 with me. Otherwise, it will come up on the screen. But in Genesis 1, we get told about God at work making the world. And Genesis 1 is more of a poem than it is a biology or a science textbook. But as we read through this, we see our God lovingly and carefully making everything that exists. And when we get to day six in this poem, the the passage slows down as it gets to the creation of mankind. And here it says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. They will rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the livestock, the whole earth, and the creatures that crawl on the earth. So God created man in his own image. He created him in the image of God. He created them male and female. God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky and every creature that crawls on the earth. God also said, look, I've given you every seed bearing plant on the surface of the entire earth and every tree whose fruit contains seed. This will be food for you, for all the wildlife of the earth, for every bird of the sky and for every creature that crawls on the earth. Everything having the breath of life in it, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw all that he had made and it was very good indeed. Evening came and then morning, the sixth day. So what does this passage tell us about our role in the renewal of all things? Here what we learn is that we are made in the image of God. Now, no other part of creation carries that honor or that privilege or that title. But what does that mean? See, the Hebrew word for image here is the word selim, which can be translated as idol or statue. And back in the day, and still in many places in our world today, what happens is that statues are placed in temples to show people what their God looks like. And God speaks here about us and says it's the same of us. In the temple of the universe, we have been made in the image of God. We are his representatives to show the world what the invisible God looks like made visible. To show the world what he is like. We are his representatives on this earth. But what is even more amazing than that is that the Hebrew term Selem Elohim, meaning the image of God, was one that was commonly used in the ancient Near East speaking of the king. Now, I'm sure you've heard of this before, but back in the day, often the king or the the ruler or the emperor was seen as the visible representative of the deity. You know, they were the son of God. They were God incarnate or they were a high priest or representative of God himself. And that really meant that kings or these authority figures had infinite power. They could do whatever they want. They could say whatever they want because the people saw them as a representative of the gods. Now, I think for us, we hear that and we think, well, that's a really convenient way to gain control and power and have your own way. But here what we see is that Genesis 1 subverts that idea, which is so powerful. Because here in Genesis 1, it doesn't say that some, but it says that all people, not just the powerful, but also the powerless, that all people, regardless of race or gender or ethnicity or nationality or class or anything, all people are made in the image of God and are ultimately his kings and queens positioned by him to rule and reign in his world. Can I just slow that down one more time? In Genesis 1, it's saying about you that God has placed you in this world as his representative and as his king or queen to rule and reign in his creation. Now, that should be a bit of an ego boost from the scriptures for you this morning. God has given you an incredible role to play in his world and in his story. So no matter what you've done, no matter what your past is, no matter what your story has looked like before, you have value. God has chosen you, God has placed you, and God has given you an important role to play in his story and world. 
But back to Genesis chapter 1. God takes Adam and Eve, man and woman, his king and queen representatives in the garden, and he gives them this commission. Genesis 1 verse 28, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it and rule or have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Theologians call this the cultural mandate. And here God, who has created the world and everything in it, invites us and tasks us to carry on the process that he began to carry on creating uh, for his glory and to extend his purposes. Now, I think uh, for some of us, that word subdue might sound a little bit offensive or a little bit harsh. But really, that word subdue that is our mandate in this world means to tame something that is wild or to bring order out of chaos. Our job in this world is to take the raw natural resources of this earth and to turn them into something, to create culture out of them. That's the role that we've been given, to create culture and shape the world in the image and the ways of God. We have been designed as God's representatives for this purpose. And we see throughout history these moments where people do do this, that great good and human flourishing comes out of mankind as we fulfill this commission. But then at other times, as mankind subvert this and twist this and use the power and authority God has given us for our own purposes and our own glory, and really, I guess, to oppress, to commit unrighteousness, evil and injustice in our world, that the world is broken by the sin of mankind. Andy Crouch, speaking about this idea of culture, says culture is what we make of the world. Culture is first of all the name for our relentless, restless human effort to take the world as it's been given to us and make something else. This is the original insight of the writer of Genesis when he says that human beings were made in God's image, just like the original creator, we are creators. So we live as God's representatives in this world and we live in a world that God made and he looked at and he said it is good. But at the same time, we live in a world that has fallen and every part of our world is affected and impacted by sin. And at the same time, we live in a world that is looking forward to Jesus's return when he will restore all things and make them new. So how do we engage with our world in its fallenness? How do we fulfill this cultural mandate with our lives? And really Andy Crouch in his book, Culture Making, which is so helpful, gives us five ways that historically the church has engaged with culture. Some of them are helpful, we should follow. Some of them are maybe not so helpful. Firstly, he says, what the church has done in the past is it has condemned culture. Now, if you've been in the church for a while, or if you're a student of history, you know this to be true. Maybe I'll just give two stories that I can think of from my world. But I remember when I joined uh, the church that I became a Christian in as an 18 year old, uh, I heard these stories of this revival that happened in Durban as the spirit of God was poured out and as men and women began to follow him. There, there seemed like there was just the surge of new young people starting to follow Jesus, new churches being planted and like this radical sense of the kingdom of God being worked out among people in Durban. And one of the things I've heard is that at that time, sometimes after church services, there would be a big bonfire that was put together and people passionate about following Jesus and ending their old life and beginning a new life in him would bring their old records or LPs or music playing devices for those of you who don't know what that is and their books and their magazines from their old life and they would come and throw them in the fire and burn them and say it is done. Now, I just want to say, I think there's some music that we shouldn't listen to because the content is blasphemous or it's just like perverse or unrighteous or just against the ways of God. And I think there's some TV shows and some movies we shouldn't watch because seeing those things is not going to be good for our souls and is not going to bring glory to God. But at the same time, just because something has not been made by a Christian doesn't mean that we should condemn it or that we shouldn't engage with it or can't enjoy it. I think Shell and I had this funny experience in our home where my gran, who's collected antiques from around the world, gave us these beautiful blue ornamental dragons that she picked up when she was traveling uh, in the East. And she gave them to us. And we've had a couple of Christian friends over the years come in and look at them and say, those things look a little bit evil. Maybe you should get rid of them or destroy them because of the look. Not, not understanding that in some ways that's re real cultural insensitivity. 
And we love those and we've really enjoyed those. And we don't believe that an artifact brings evil into the home because as Jesus says, it's not what goes into a person that defiles him, but what comes out of a person that defiles him. Really sin is found in our hearts and in what we do with anything. Objects are not good or bad. It's what we do with them that makes them good or bad. So that's the first thing, to condemn culture. The second way Christians can engage with culture is by critiquing it. Now, I think this is a much better response, but it's something that not many of us do. You know, most of us don't think through and process the culture that we live in or the cultural goods we consume. I doubt many of you sit down in front of Netflix and watch a show and then think, oh, you know what was really interesting is to see the redemptive narrative that just threaded its way through the story, or you could see elements of the gospel in there. We, we don't do that. And we don't always think through as we read things on social media or just in the news, the philosophies and the ideologies and the worldviews behind those opinion pieces and even just the designs that we see and we look at. The third thing that Christians can do is we copy culture. And this definitely seems to be something that happened in the 90s and, I don't know, early 2000s. It seems like there was this swing from Christians condemning culture to starting to say, well, you know what, if we can't engage with the secular stuff, let's make our own versions of it. You know, if we like that type of music, let's just throw in a Jesus here and a hallelujah there, and then we should be fine. Or if a certain genre of books became popular, zombie books or whatever, let's make a Christian zombie novel. Or if this kind of film became popular, let's make a Christian version. I think maybe the best illustration of this is that you can subscribe to Netflix and watch shows there, or you can get Pureflix and get good, wholesome Christian content. Now, I think there's nothing wrong with that. And if you do that, that's absolutely fine. But I think what this has meant in the copying of kind of secular culture around us is that the word Christian, as someone said, has become a great noun and a terrible adjective. And you've probably experienced this. You know, someone said, hey, let's watch a movie tonight. You go, yeah, that sounds great. They say, I found this really good new Christian film. And you go, oh, really? Christian film? Because Christian has become an adjective for something that often has copied something else and isn't very good. And what we see in history is the church went from producing some of the greatest art and science and philosophy and music of all time and now is copying the culture around us and producing these cheap knockoffs rather than these glorious works to the glory of God and forming this bizarre ghetto Christian subculture at the same time. The fourth thing that Crouch speaks about, and this is probably the thing I, I'm most concerned about as the pastor of this church, is that we just consume culture. That today there's been a swing from condemning culture, critiquing culture, copying culture, to now we just passively consume the cultural artifacts that are around us. You know, we don't necessarily think through or filter the things that we read or the things that we watch. We don't look at them, watch them, absorb them through a biblical lens. We just internalize them and are shaped by them. And for some of us, or for some of us at least in our city, we are more strongly discipled by the spirit of the age and by the media that we consume and by the changing uh, opinions of society around us than we are by Jesus, our Savior and Lord. And in the worst situations, what we find is that the church is no longer holy or set apart or consecrated to God. We're just like everyone else, you know. We do what they do for the same reasons. We say what they say. We act like they act. We make the same decisions and have the same priorities. The only difference is that sometimes on Sundays when we feel like it, we go to this church service in the mornings. But Genesis 1 has got such a, a greater picture of cultural creation. In Genesis 1, we see the call to create culture. And that doesn't mean that you have to move to Hollywood and make films. It doesn't mean that you have to write books or publish magazines or be an Instagram influencer at all. Culture is a whole way of life. But at the same time, it doesn't mean that you need to be influential or powerful. You do not need to be a president to uh, create culture. You don't need to be a CEO of a big organization or a national policy maker or decision maker. You don't need to have a global platform to do this. The Bible shows us that men and women have been given callings and um, I guess different capacities and spheres of influence by God. And whatever he has given to you, you need to steward that well for his glory. That's five or 10 people, that's amazing. That's 50 or 100, that's great. That's thousands or if that's nations or the world. If God gives you influence in those ways, whatever it is, we steward it for his glory. Now, for some of us today, that might mean be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth and subdue it in your home, in your space with the people that you live with. 
For some of you, that might mean in a classroom or, or with 30 students. That could mean with your employees in your business or your co-workers at the office. That could mean the clients you see during the week or the people you come in contact with in the gym. Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Tim Keller uh, shares this amazing illustration about Andy Crouch's wife, Catherine. He says about her, in her work as a professor of physics, Catherine can do much to shape the culture of her courses and her research lab. In the sterile and technological environment of a laboratory, she can play classical music to create an atmosphere of creativity and beauty. She can shape the way her students respond to exciting and disappointing results and can model both hard work and good rest rather than frantic work and fitful procrastination. By bringing her children with her to work occasionally, she can create a culture where family is not an interruption from work and where research and teaching are natural parts of a mother's life. And by inviting her students into our home, she can show that she values them as persons, not just as units of research productivity. At the small scale of her laboratory and classroom, she has the real ability to reshape the world. By simply living a faithful Christian presence in the world that you inhabit, and by lovingly speaking out and standing up for what is right, and by embodying the, embodying the values and cultures of God's kingdom, we create culture around us. And this is the way the grassroots countercultural movement of Jesus has always advanced his kingdom and joined God in the renewal of all things. Let me end with one last quote. Nancy Piercy in her book, Total Truth says, in Genesis, God gives what we might call the first job description. Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. The first phrase, be fruitful and multiply, means to develop the social world. Build families, churches, schools, cities, governments, laws. The second phrase, subdue the earth, means to harness the natural world. Plant crops, build bridges, design computers, compose music. This passage is sometimes called the cultural mandate because it tells us that our original purpose was to create cultures, build civilizations, nothing less. Isn't that inspiring? This passage is telling us that it's not just what we do on Sundays that matters to God for us as Christians, but everything we do matters to God and has value in this world and in the world to come. Harvest City, what I want to say to you today is that you have been invited by God to join him in his work of renewing all things. And that as he is reconciling all things to himself in Christ, you and I are called to play a part as he is making peace by his blood shed on the cross. Now, before we end this morning, I would hate you to run off and not process this and personalize this a little bit today. I want to ask you to answer the question, what does the cultural mandate mean for you? What does gospel renewal look like in your life, in your home, in your workplace, through your job? with your influence and your money and your voice and your time and everything that God has given you to steward. Maybe you can spend some time thinking about this and praying about what ways you are called to create culture in and through your life. Maybe you can discuss it with the people around you or give someone a call this week to talk about that. And as we end today, I just want to say, Harvest City, I bless you. And I want to send you out today as we go to see his kingdom come and to see his will be done in Durban as it is in heaven. Oh.
his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and Ah. Uh...